Good morning, everybody. My name is Anthony Giddens. I'm director of uh, LSE. It is uh, my very great pleasure to welcome you all here this morning. And, of course, to welcome our most distinguished guest, one of the great heroes of the 20th century, and indeed the 21st century, too, Nelson Mandela. Stay, stay. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the LSE, we believe, has long been and remains the best social science institution in the world. As such, we've had a long series of links with Africa. Over the past few years, We've been developing numerous connections with South Africa specifically, led especially by Dr. Jonathan Leap with the Center for South African Studies. Everything in the LSE has an acronym, and this is called CREFSA, but it is a Center for South African Studies. And I'm very happy to say publicly how much the LSE supports the work of this center. This is a period of really, really big social change. Everybody knows, I think, what, what the great forces moving our world are. They are the impact of intensifying globalization plus the infect, impact of new information technology. Every country has to react to these changes. Some people say that these changes will affect the less developed parts of the world adversely, I have to say, I do not believe this to be true. There is no alternative for a country which wants to move ahead except to engage with the global economy. There is no alternative except to engage with the new information economy. South Africa, I believe, can make that successful engagement. There will, of course, be problems. One of the famous observations in Mr. Mandela's much celebrated autobiography is having climbed a very large mountain, one always only finds there are further mountains to climb. We're very happy to welcome him here, and we're very happy that he's still climbing uh, today. I now hand over to Lord Grabener, the uh, chairman of the LSE Court of Governors, to introduce Mr. Mambella more directly. Thank you. Uh, that is certainly not the most difficult task I have ever had to perform, um, and equally it is certainly the most pleasurable. I take enormous pleasure in introducing President Mandela, because when I was a student here, now a long time ago in the 1960s, our political discussions in the coffee bars and in the student union were almost entirely devoted to the evils associated with apartheid. As students, there was nothing much that we could do about it in any practical sense. And we certainly could not have predicted the subsequent events or foreseen a day uh, such as today. It is difficult for any of us really to understand what you have been through in your life, President Mandela. I cannot improve on your own very concise summary. In 1995, when you opened the new South African Constitutional Court, you said these words. The last time that I set foot in a courtroom was in order to hear whether or not I was going to be sentenced to death. President Mandela, it is my very great privilege to introduce you to today's LSE.
ladies and gentlemen, forgive me if I'm somewhat nervous. I come, as you know, from the colonies. We are not used to be in the presence of such an august gathering. <clears throat> I grew up in the Eastern Cape, an area of South Africa much like the one so well described to you by Thomas Hardy. It was a world of oral traditions, healing properties were herbal, an abscess would be treated with poultices Clean water was simple, not available. Gastrointestinal infections, malaria, cholera were rampant. Life was brutish and short. Electricity and the horseless courage did not exist for me. The hardness and poverty of existence was aggravated by an uncaring society. Colonies were meant to be exploited both for the mother country and for those who came to settle in our areas. Fresh in the memories of the older generation, of the poorest, of the very poor, and spoken of in low, harsh tones of what was said to be a hugely profitable a business that was said to have been abolished that was the business of slavery. My youth and young adulthood was spent with others in fighting an unjust and oppressive system. Many African leaders today would say exactly the same thing. And when you assess the achievements and failures of Africa, you must always keep this background in mind. One of the greatest mistakes which are made by serious political commentators today is to judge us on the same basis in which you judge your opinion makers in the old and advanced industrial countries, forgetting that for more than three centuries our people were denied of the privileges which you take for granted. You went to the best schools in the country, well equipped with highly qualified educators, classrooms which are properly equipped with learning aids, where the language at school was identical 
with the language at home, with parents with a high level of educational accomplishment, who could help their children to grasp sophisticated concepts at an early age. But uh, when you consider the situation of the blacks in Africa, you come across a different state of affairs. Uh, children who go to schools without any learning aids, taught in a language which is not theirs, by teachers often not so very qualified. The child goes back to school, normally with parents who have no educational background at all, poor children eating porridge in the morning, porridge at lunch, porridge as their dinner, unable to concentrate, large families with little room to move about, a child that shares a room with about three or four others. No table, no chairs, doing their homework on the floor. These are the people who are leading Africa today. And I hope that when you make your assessment, you will bear in mind this background. The people who run governments in, South, in Africa today are people who are never given any opportunity to train in government, as many of you do. And I have no doubt that uh, you will bear this in mind, not only in our discussions here, but when examining uh, the whole situation in Africa. Being a former head of state has its advantages. One of them is having the time to speak in institutions where young people must listen while their elders pose difficult questions. I trust that my honorary membership of the student unions offer a number of London University colleges, including LSE, will not mean that I have to try to provide answers myself, <clears throat> nor that I will be examined on what I say. One shares one's thoughts with added confidence at a university with a proud record of solidarity with the struggles of oppressed peoples, and which is also renowned worldwide as a center of learning and inquiry. LSE, as part of the University of London, was in the vanguard of the great army of men and women across the world who responded to the call to isolate the apartheid regime. They insisted that human rights are the rights of all people everywhere. I feel greatly honored to have an honorary degree from the University of London. Today brings an opportunity to thank LSE in person and with all humility for the part it played in that tribute to the South African people for their achievement in turning from conflict to the peaceful pursuit of a better life for all. For many South Africans, 
LSE also meant the opportunity for learning that apartheid denied them in their own country. Those former students are now working in all sectors of our society, leaders of a nation, building a bright and common future. We continue to draw upon you for training and knowledge in fields that are critical to the development of our country. May your practical solidarity and our partnership long continue. Your invitation to me to reflect with you on the challenges facing Africa speaks of your continuing commitment to our shared goals. And I thank you most sincerely. The difficult question I wish to pose today is simple this. What historical stage is Africa going through? As is generally the case with questions of history and development, an adequate answer will require years of work by African historians and social scientists in partnership with institutions like yours. This is especially so given the rapid and far-reaching changes affecting the world as a whole. And it is quite likely that future historians will not see this period in quite the same way as we who are living through it. So I will exercise that privilege I refer to and not try to answer the question other than to say this. We are convinced that we are in a period of decisive historical significance for Africa and its place in the world. We are determined that this 21st century shall indeed be the African century. Matching the scale of what we are seeking to bring about, our challenges are formulated in terms that may evoke periods of major historical change in other regions of the world in other times. Thus, the idea of an African renaissance has taken hold in our continent with all the resonance of an idea whose time has come. But the rebirth we are engaged in is not one that will culminate as European renaissance did in colonization and dominance of a world economic system of which the slave trade was an integral part. Ours is, however, a rebirth that must deal with problems that, drive, that derive from Africa's historical relations with the rest of the world established in that period. And this must be achieved in a rapidly globalizing world. A second historical project related to the first is that of building strong institutions in a united continent, political, economic, and social institutions at national, regional, and continental levels. The weak states that are also part of our historical legacy are among the conditions which all too easily allow warlordism to emerge, ethnic mobilization to divide the united peoples 
into warring forces. And the resulting tensions and conflicts to threaten regions with instability. Again, this process of building strong states and institutions cannot pass through the horrific destruction and slaughter that Europe inflicted upon itself before it achieved that goal above all in the first half of the 20th century. On the other hand, the system of multilateral and international institutions that were established in the middle of the 20th century to ensure that such catastrophes do not happen again, do provide an important part of the armory of weapons for building an equitable world. This remains true even as we seek to reform our international organizations so that they reflect in practice the democratic principles of a decolonized world. The vision expressed in, in the idea of African Renaissance is that of the reconstruction and development of an Africa in which people's lives are constantly and rapidly improving towards the standards broadly, broadly in line with the best in the world. It is also a vision of an Africa that is integrated in the world on an equal basis. Africa collectively stands at the bottom of the world scale of development. Concretely, this means for millions the ills brought by poverty and underdevelopment. The scourges of disease such as malaria, tuberculosis, and HIV AIDS, and educational programs that are far from what is needed for Africa's full participation in the modern economy and society. As the world is seeing now in what the floods are doing to the people of Mozambique and parts of South Africa, it means a vulnerability to environmental disaster. If, despite all this, we talk with conviction, <clears throat> excuse me, we talk with conviction of realizing our long cherished dream of rebirth and reconstruction. It is because the conditions for doing so now exist. They include at the stage of development of the world economy. While this brings the danger that historical imbalances may be entrenched and even weakened, it also brings opportunities for Africa as a region of vast untapped potential. The conditions include the liberation of South Africa as the culmination of Africa's struggle against colonial and white minority rule. This brought a new possibilities for the continent to focus energies and resources on shaping its own development rather than having to devote them to resistance to colonial and racial oppression. And the conditions for the regeneration of Africa include the growing mass movement of Africans during the past two decades manifested in struggles against dictatorship and undemocratic rule. Part of this process, and in turn giving it impetus, is the emergence of a new generation of African leaders capable men and women who are not prepared to accept as inevitable the current conditions under which the ordinary African lives. 
It is for such regimes, reasons that we are hopeful for the future. This is not to gloss over our problems or to underestimate the scale of what is required. Nor is it to ignore, to ignore the fact that some of our problems are of our own making, as we know from the record of the first decades of independence. The achievement of our vision requires rapid industrialization that exploits our scarcely tapped resources and our strategic geographical location. In turn, that requires massive programs for infrastructural development, for the regeneration of our cities, and for the education of our people. In our interdependent modern world, what happens in one country impacts on many others. What happens in Africa impacts on its relations with the world. Sustainable growth and development therefore requires peace, security, and stability, and they require the unity of the African continent. Peace is the greatest weapon for development. Conversely, conflicts and tensions that undermine stability and security can set back the progress that we have started to make on the path of development. What gives hope is that Africa's leaders are finding creative ways of addressing the resolution of conflicts. We do believe that South Africa's transition, hailed by many as a miracle, though in, relate, in reality it was based on the actions of humans, had, has had a great importance in demonstrating what is possible when the will and the conditions for peace are there. What is always difficult in life is not so much to influence and change others. The most difficult question is to change yourself in accordance with the conditions that you confront. And as I have pointed out before, one of the most difficult questions we faced, those in jail, those in exile, and those that worked on the ground, was to reconcile our emotions with our thinking. Our feeling was that under no circumstances Shall we sit down with the apartheid regime? Who have subjected us for centuries to some of the most painful experiences you can think of? For that reason, it was unthinkable for us to sit down with our enemies and talk. But our brains said, if you don't sit down with these people, your country will go up in smoke. And innocent civilians will be slaughtered. The infrastructure of the country will be destroyed. Community development will come to an end. And the problem was to reconcile these two, your feelings and your thinking. We face the problems among our own comrades and colleagues. 
we face problems with the enemy that had continued to say for decades we will never negotiate with terrorists. And we had to find a way so that they could cross a silver bridge without humiliation. It was the ability to reconcile these two contradictions that were able to bring about a, transforma a peaceful transformation in our country and to confound the prophets of doom who predicted that there would never be a peaceful change in our country, that any attempt to bring about changes would uh, engulf South Africa in rivers of blood. We were able to prove them wrong because uh, we were able to change ourselves first and foremost. <clears throat> and anybody who wants to have an impact in society must start from himself or herself. Though South Africa has responded whenever requested to assist in the resolution of conflict, it is always on the basis that only the participants in the conflicts can themselves achieve lasting solutions. I have come from the latest meeting in Arusha, confident that we are on the verge of a breakthrough and that the process will indeed bring lasting peace to Burundi and her people. Now, when I went to Burundi, I hardly knew what I know now. I was not aware of the caliber of the leadership of that country. But I was tremendously impressed that out of the 18 political parties, you had six graduates in engineering trained in Brussels, Paris, Germany, and Russia. That you had four graduates in law, two medical doctors, one graduate in mathematics, a graduate in economics, a graduate in French literature, a graduate in biology, a graduate in sociology. That is the caliber of the leadership that I'm dealing with. And it was for that reason that right from the start, I believed, I was certain that sooner or later, we will have a breakthrough. <clears throat> but the monumental work done by Mwalimu Yerere, former president of Tanzania, was absolutely impressive. And uh, we have an e comparatively easier task of tying up the loose ends. He has done, he did the basic work. Now I say that uh, indeed the process of bringing lasting peace into Burundi and her people is looming. That is because the two principal conditions for peace are being met. One is that all contending parties should be ready to participate in the process. And the other is a readiness on the part of all leaders to compromise on the basis of a recognition that they have certain interests in common as Burundians that are more important 
that than whatever differences divide them. Amongst those common principles is that it is totally intolerable that innocent men, women and children, the disabled, should suffer loss of freedom and even be slaughtered because leaders cannot make the compromises required for peace. The way in which this principle has so often been violated in human history is a tragic indictment of political leadership. What underpins one's hope for Africa's future is the way in which the peace process in Burundi has been promoted by the joint effort of leaders from many African countries and with the active support of the international community. Together, in consultation with and under the guidance of the Organization of African Unity, they have been exercising collective responsibility for African peace and security. The international support that has been vital for the peace process will continue to be important in the reconstruction of Burundi that peace will make possible. Such is the path towards reconstruction and development of Africa. Leaders who do not put the interests of their people above their own cannot achieve lasting peace and therefore sustainable development. No country in Africa can solve its problem on its own. Nor can Africa achieve her goals on her own. Ambitious programs of economic reconstruction ensuring peace, stability, and security, and dealing with problems deriving from the historical relations of Africa with the rest of the world requires a pooling of sovereignty, removing the burden of external debt, and negotiating equitable trade regimes and systems of investment require a collective African voice that reflects a popular conviction that the continent is indeed on the path towards a rapidly improving life for all its people, and that Africa is indeed returning from the margins to the mainstream of world history. That is why we include amongst our priorities the building of cooperation with the rest of the South and partnership with the industrialized countries of the North. <clears throat> that is why we lay stress on the development of our regional and continental organizations and the progress towards economic integration. That is why the entrenchment of democracy is fundamental to our future. Africa's position in the world today will depend on what Africa does to and with itself. In the end, that is why we do remain confident in our determination that we are at the dawn of the African centuries. I hope observers from Europe have not lost sight of what is happening in Africa, something which is exemplary for many parts of the world. It is common knowledge that some years back, General Obasanjo of Nigeria staged a coup in his country because of reasons which he explained, which, which in many respects were convincing. But he made an announcement when he staged that coup that within three years, 
he would hand over power to a civilian authority. He did that. Then there is the case of General Abubakar, also in Nigeria, when Sonny Abacha died, General Abubakar Abu took over as head of the military government. But at the same time, he made a statement that as soon as he had normalized the situation, he would hand over to civilian rule. Both soldiers honored their commitment. Today, General Abbasanjo is the president of Nigeria through the ballot box. He is now chairman of the 77 group of nations, which will be meeting shortly in Havana, in Cuba. General Abubakar, I invited him to the summit of the non-aligned movement because of his declaration that he would hand over to the civilian authority. He was warmly welcomed by delegates from all over the world because of the example that he had set. And uh, he was given the honor at one stage of sharing the proceedings of the non-aligned movement. Then you have heard that the case of Nyerere who knew exactly when to step down. He stepped down at the height of his power and popularity and made way for younger people. President Kwat Masiri of Botswana has done exactly the same thing. At the height of his popularity, he stepped down and made way for younger blood. These things are happening in a continent which is regarded as still living in the dark ages. I want you to open your eyes and to observe what is going on in that continent. Almost every country, with a few exceptions, has now democratized. And these are developments which give us the hope that whatever problems we have, and we have many, and some of them are very serious, we nonetheless have men and women who are highly gifted and capable of rising to the challenges that face at the continent. You will again excuse me by ending up by telling a story which I've told several times of a young lady of five who came to my gate in my house. And security said, look, there is a young lady here of five who wants to see you. I said, let him in, let her in. They say, Mr. President, she's very cheeky. <laughs> I say precisely for that, let her come in. <laughs> and indeed, she was quite a lady. I was sitting in my lounge. She, she just stormed in without a knocking. And the first question she asked was, how old are you? <laughs> I said, well, I'm very sorry. I can't remember. <laughs> but I was born long, long ago. She said, uh, two years ago? <clears throat> I say, no, much longer than that. Then she changed the subject and said, why did you go to jail? I say, no, I didn't go to jail because I liked. Some people forced me to go there. Who? Uh, people who don't like me. And how long did you stay there? I said, again, again, I can't remember. But it was a very, very long time. Again, the question of two years came in. <laughs> and when I couldn't answer her question, she said, you must be a very stupid old man. <laughs> and having said that, she continued talking to me as if she had paid me a compliment. 
Ladies and gentlemen, I tell this story so that if you feel that I have not risen to expectations, please be a little more diplomatic than that young lady. <laughs> socio-economic conditions which I do not help her towards the advancement of humanity wherever that occurred. Men and women who fight the suppression of human rights, who fight disease, illiteracy, ignorance, poverty, and hunger. Some are known, others are known. Those are the people who have inspired me and indeed many of you here at Elston. Second question is from Bella Isaacs, who is an LSE graduate. Survival technique. <laughs> 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 and I'm by Thank you. I said sorry. 
I am very jealous of my reputation. <laughs> I wouldn't like to do this with uh, former jail birds. <laughs> but uh, I must say, correct, correct, a mistake which has been committed for several times of thinking that uh, one individual is a uh, shown of bitterness, and that is an exception. And also that he has been responsible for bringing about the sea change in the policy of this country. As I have pointed out before, we are essentially a generation of leaders which belongs in collective effort in teamwork. And uh, an individual may be chosen to articulate views which have been thoroughly canvassed in a committee and uh, where opposing views uh, were expressed thoroughly debated, so that uh, anybody, when they go outside and express those views, anybody who opposes them, generally loses his or her credibility. That is the environment in which we have been produced. And uh, none of us, including me, have got experiences which uh, they can place before you experiences as an individual. If you want me to place before you what we as a team have done and what we think that should be the approach in dealing with questions such as confront a politician, then I've got an easy task. And, uh, but uh, I do want to point out that as some of us, do not have not really made the contribution which are worth the things we have. There are many men and women who have made a greater contribution, for example, in the leadership of the African Cultural Congress than myself. There were people in jail who were more inspired to their colleagues than I was able to do. And uh, there are a number of uh, after Jane Bird's here. There's one, one, two, three, four, the fourth at the end of this line. <laughs> uh, General Sitaka, just come up for stand as you can see. He will tell you that on numerous occasions. I came with an idea, and they overruled me. <laughs> and I had to accept that. And uh, there is a story I normally tell to show how ordinary I am and how wrong I can be. <laughs> I made a suggestion to the National Executive of the ANC that had to vote in our country the voting age must be reduced to 14. And I pointed out that in seven different countries in the world, the voting age has been reduced to 14. Because in those countries, you had young people who never experienced childhood, who went out at 10, 11, 12, 
uh, to go and fight for the liberation of that country. They did so and liberated that country. And uh, the authorities that uh, were decided that because of the contribution of these children, they must be given the right to determine jointly with the rest of the population the affairs of that country. I came along with this approach. I did not expect such a position as I got. <laughs> Almost everybody, I was all alone, and I had to withdraw. But uh, to complete the rejection of my seat, one of the influential newspapers uh, in South Africa, at the Kapu, where they showed me the preaching, uh, with a baby with napkin <laughs> and putting a ballot paper in the ballot paper. <laughs> I realized that I was totally wrong. <laughs> now, that is the picture I would like you to have. That uh, none of us, at least of all me, have uh, the ability, the skills uh, to answer your question. But if I have uh, my equality, it would be easy for me to deal with your friend. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I have with me a highly prized object, which is an LSE plastic bag. <laughs> Inside this bag, we have a number of presents to uh, mark this auspicious occasion. I won't hand them all over. I'll just hand over one, which is an LSE cricket cap. <laughs> I'd like now to uh, invite onto the stage the Poet Laureate, Andrew Motion.
Uh, Mr. Mandela, members of the audience, do not be worried if the lights suddenly go down, as we have one further final surprise for you this morning. Yeah. 